Okay, so I think we'll start. It's five past 10. And if people are coming in on Zoom, they can just join when they get here. Um, we've got quite a few people already in the call. Um, so welcome, everybody. Really um, delighted um, to be hosting the seminar as part of the pro um, activities of our um, Shame and Medicine project, which is a research project we have here in Exeter funded by the Wellcome Trust. Um, some of you might know about it already. And really happy today to welcome Sarah Cohen Shabbat um, to come and speak to us about her research on obstetric violence, um, which I've been following for some time. And I've been a fan of Sarah's work for many years. And it's just amazing to have you here in Exeter. <laughs> um, and yeah, Sarah's coming um, to us from uh, her sabbatical year where she's being hosted by, um, which college are you in at Oxford? Regent's Park. Regent's Park College at uh, the University of Oxford. Um, but she is an associate professor at the Women's and Gender Studies program at the University of Haifa, and she specializes in phenomenology, feminist philosophy, and philosophies, philosophies of the body. Um, her present research and publications address feminist philosophical perspectives on childbirth and the maternal embodied subject, focusing recently on the phenomenon of obstetric violence as gender violence. Um, and she's published many papers about this topic. Um, and we're really excited to welcome her here today to speak particularly about shame in obstetric violence. And her talk is called Grotesque Bodies, Bad Mothers and the Question of Complicity. Um, Sarah has some slides which will be prepared. And we'll put those up now. And then we'll get going. And while we're waiting for that, we're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. While we're waiting for those, I will keep admitting people. What, so they're listening to me already? Yeah, we okay, are. Okay, so I just want to say thank you very much, <laughs> Luna and, and all the team for inviting me here. And it's really amazing. And it's mutual the admiration for Luna's work these years. And I am really happy to be here at Tech Center now. And um, first, I, I think I need to maybe to apologize if my English will be not great. Uh, this is the English is my, my third language after <laughs> Spanish and Hebrew, so <laughs> be patient. Mm -hmm. And um, and also what I'm going to present here today is uh, part of my very extensive extensive work on obstetric violence of these last years. Uh, but also things that I, I, I'm, I try to do a lot in this presentation. I hope it's not too much and I hope it will make sense. And if not, so also tell me about it because I, I'm trying now to connect also parts of this, this um, work that I've been doing to some of my older work on the grotesque, the grotesque bodies, which I did in my PhD 20 years ago. Um, which I think it was too, I was waiting until like to, to bring it again. And now I think it's so there. So I'm, I'm bringing it in. And also the question of complicity, which I'm trying to also work on. And of course, also in the end, disability theories, which uh, I'm really interested in right now. And they're part of my new project that I wrote for a grant. And so I'm also trying to bring them in so let's see if everything fits uh, together. Sorry. I will be most slide mover if that's okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. it's too complicated. For... <laughs> okay, so now we can start in the next slide. She says three, one. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, there it is. <clears throat> okay, so these are the main issues that I'm going to talk about, as I said, obstetric violence as gender violence, uh, the role of gender shame, uh, grotesque bodies, the, the issue of docile femininity and complicity uh, with obstetric violence in the labor room, the um, issue of intensive motherhood as also another uh, issue, rising shame, in mothers to be and disability theories uh, that I spoke about now before. Okay, so we can go on or start again. <laughs> so, 
technical issues. Yeah. We're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so just to say that I arrived to this subject of obstetric violence, of course, uh, from my own experience of uh, my own labor as violent. This was my second uh, and uh, regretfully last child because I, I wanted more and then it didn't. It's also another story of also many miscarriages where I also got some very bad issues with doctors and also I wrote about them uh, in, in other in papers on obstetric violence, but this was my last labor of a live baby, my second child. And um, it, it, was in, it was interesting because in the end, it was a labor that went well in the sense that I had a healthy baby. I was healthy in the end. I, I was not even cut or sutured or something like that, anything like that. Um, but it, it left me really uh, with profound scars uh, emotionally. And I knew something was not right uh, with what happened there. And just, of course, I took philosophy and concepts as my tool to understand what happened there. And I then discovered the concept of obstetric violence, which is, of course, not mine. Uh, and then I, I started to do philosophical work. And, and, I, and I saw that there was a lot of violence there, even though it, it was like a kind of normalized violence and very subtle. Uh, violence and, and all, the whole experience left me uh, very much disempowered and um, I felt I was not in control and I felt mm -hmm. I was um, controlled by all these forces in the labor room. So it was what, this was what brought me to this issue and of course um, if we speak of obstetric violence in general we find physical and emotional mistreatment as the main thing also the human, dehumanization and if we say it like phenomenologically, it's turning women's bodies from life to corporate, from body subject to body object. And of course, our philosophers, many philosophers, and also sociologists speaking about this through leather, Emily Martin in the context of birth, through leather in the context of medicine in general. Uh, so this dehumanization is very present. Um, yes, we can go on. Um, so, I think there was another one before or not, no? Yes? Okay. <laughs> okay, so obstetric violence, this is, this is from the law on obstetric violence, which in Venezuela is the first country in 2007 to bring a, like a law, really a law in uh, in the context of human rights of women, human uh, women's human rights, and um, it's interesting that in Latin America, this fight for against obstetric violence has been going on almost for twenty or thirty years. It's something that it has just later on uh, came to the United States and Europe, and that Latin America are the pioneers of this uh, fight against obstetric violence. I have some theories about it, why it happened, but okay, it's not for now. So the, what is obstetric violence according to this law? The appropriation of the body and reproductive processes of women by health personnel, which is expressed as dehumanized treatment and abuse of medication and to convert the natural processes into pathological ones, bringing with it loss of autonomy and the ability to decide freely about their bodies and sexuality, negatively impacting the quality of life of women. So there is a lot here about what I said before about dehumanization and converting these uh, subjects into objects. Um, we ta ta um, taking the subjectivity out of this. Uh, so. Oh, no. Sorry, technical issues on the slides yes. getting there. Maybe, okay. If, the, if it's better this way, we can do it this way, like, you know, no, I do I see what you mean, yeah, just from here. Yes. Yeah. Ah, so this, this slide was before the other slides, so it's okay. So such a violence is just to say it's an intersection between institutional violence and violence against women, 
during pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum. Um, the um, categorization of obstetric violence as gender violence is one that has been done. It was, I mean, I always say that I was in the right place at the right time. I wrote my first paper on obstetric violence in 2015. And I went on saying, arguing that this is not only medical violence, this is gender violence, specifically directed towards women. And I, I think that many health uh, researchers were doing research at that, those times on this issue, and they took this paper as the basis to say, this is, also, this is gender violence. So that's why this paper exploded and it was quoted by many people researching this in health. Um, so yes, so I, I don't know what I'm saying why, why it's gender violence, although I think it's, it's very clear, but we'll talk about more of this later. Okay, this is funny, not so funny. Um, this is a, this is an advertisement of uh, promotion material of um, Israeli sh TV show a reality called Baby Boom, with a reality in the hosp in hospitals, in labor rooms. So they're filming uh, birds and real birds and uh, everything around. So this is the announcement. So I, I know this uh, professor. I even went to a conference. With, I was together with him in a, in a panel. So this is a <laughs> very um, recognized doctor in Israel, obstetrician. So look at this picture. Right, so this he's a doctor. Um, these are the nurses or midwives, the husband, and Mother. that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. So, and even the, the doctor, you know, you can see this aurea, <laughs> the savior of the baby. And um, yes, it's, it's terrible. And I, I, I think it really shows the dehumanization of women. Uh, this is from the UK. It's called uh, One Every Minute. Mm -hmm. And this is also the promotion, the promotional material. So it's similar. Mm -hmm. You can see, uh, at least we have there some female doctors or, or nurses or something. But again, it's uh, legs on a, mm -hmm. on a bed. So it's from pri privately from Israel. OK. so. Okay, research on obstetric violence is growing constantly. Uh, there are, these are some of the papers from the last years. So I bring this usually when I have to convince people that it's not just a crazy term used by crazy feminists or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so people in health, even the UN, even the health, World Health Organization have describe this, this phenomenon as something that is a problem globally that we need to solve. So many, much research is being done on this uh, lately. Um, okay, so this, is, this was my first uh, paper on obstetric violence, the one in 2016. And uh, this was a paper where I argue um, with the help of Iris Marion Young's Throwing Like a Girl, that the um, women's bodies in labor are strong, explosive, expandive. So they don't behave as they should be, like in the feminine sense. They are not feminine bodies. So they are put in place with violence uh, for, by the medicalized system, uh, which needs to control them. Uh, so this is the argument like, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, I have some quotes from there here. Yes, the next one. Okay, so women in labor are performing an extremely difficult, physically consuming, sometimes excruciating, excruciatingly painful task. There is no need to essentialize birth, childbirth, turning it into a sublime, beautiful, natural event to recognize its power and its active character. Labor, in fact, is totally incongruent with the midst of delicate, soft, weak femininity. The laboring body is thus almost an oxymoron. It is a feminine body in the highest sense, birthing, accomplishing the task of femininity, revealing the mysterious essence of women, 
but it is on the other hand a strong, active, creative body capable of enduring and recovering from the splitting of its flesh. This is what makes it dangerous prone to domestication and control. So this is from uh, this paper. Um, and I continue, laboring bodies then are violently turned into objects, not only because this is comfortable for the medical staff, so it's not only medical violence, but mainly because they are feminine bodies threatening their own passive femininity, bodies acting from immanence, reaching towards transcendence, living vigorous sexual bodies challenging patriarchy. Their sexuality thus appears to be not a commodified sexuality, but one that owns itself, a sexuality in charge of itself, so to speak, and not existing purely as object for the other. This is a body then that has to be put in its place to be reminded again and again about its inner facility. Okay. Uh, yes, it's, it's a pity that we cannot see the full uh, slide, but... Um, um, now we can go right, top right, there's a little arrow that you can close the bar. Yeah, I can certainly do that. Yeah. Okay, so this is, in the meantime, this is Cindy Sherman's work. Oh, yeah. And. No, it doesn't, sorry, forgive me, it doesn't like that. Come back up. Um, Try to. Okay. So, um, so uh, birthing bodies are, in my view, also grotesque bodies. And when I say grotesque, I need to, to say this is not grotesque in the popular sense of saying this is terrible and um, I don't know, like monstrous in the bad sense or something like that. But it's uh, I'm using the term as in literature, as in literary criticism as, as in Bartins, which I will bring now uses it, uh, like speaking about bodies which don't have clear contours. They are mixed with the world. They enter the world and take the world into them. They are open bodies, expansive. And so usually grotesque bodies are also many times pregnant bodies. So I think the birthing body has a grotesque quality, which we can use later on, I will tell you why exactly. But uh, okay, this is just one illustration of, of uh, some grotesqueness of maybe of pregnant bodies, uh, birthing bodies. Yes, we can go on. So the grotesque body is an excessive and transgress transgressive body, and this is from Bartin. Um, he, his book from 65, uh, uh, Rabelais and his world, he writes, the grotesque body is not separated from the rest of the world. It is not a closed, completed unit. Uh, it is unfinished and so outgrows itself, transgresses its own limits. The stress is laid on those parts of the body that are open to the outside world, that is the parts through which the world enters the body or emerges from it, or through which the body itself goes out to meet the world. This means that the emphasis is on the apertures or the convexities or on various ramifications and options, the open mouth, the genital organs, the breast, the phallus, the pot belly, the nose. The body discloses its essence as a principle of growth, which exceeds its own limits only in copulation, pregnancy, childbirth, the throes of death, eating, drinking, and defecation. This is the ever unfinished, ever creating body. So I think we can use Bartin also to understand more about the, the uh, working body. Yes, so. So I argued that birthing bodies are grotesque and, though, and, th and thus they are also transgressive. They're also dangerous. I am thinking now, I'm, I'm just writing about it. But I, I'm thinking about miscarriage and abortion as a redouble grotesqueness of these bodies, mm -hmm. because they also mixture um, death and life together. Also, something that that um, um, the grotesque shows is a mixture of opposites. So death and uh, uh, life are together in this miscarriage, uh, miscarriaging bodies 
or abortion bodies. Uh, this produces increased shame and anxiety, both in laboring persons and in the medical staff, thus increasing violence. I have a student who has been doing um, a thesis writing on obstetric violence existing in cases of miscarriages. Uh, and it's interesting because many times the um, excuse that we have from medical staff for doing certain things or behaving in certain ways towards uh, birthing women is we need to save the baby. We need to do everything to save the baby. And in these cases, there is no baby to save. And still, we have violence. And sometimes we have even more violence. It's like if they are really mad that they cannot do anything to make this happen and to save these babies. So we find sometimes even more stress, more shame, and uh, incre thus increasing violence too. So, but this is something I think we have to study more. Um, another thing that I think that we can connect uh, with the grotesque and birthing bodies is um, the dirt present in birth. Uh, birth is a dirty song, and um, many times what medical staff is trying to do is to sanitize birth and to turn it into a very um, uh, sterile area and to to see all these performance happening in birth as something we have to control and sterilize, okay? So, um, and, and, and sometimes this cleaning uh, obsession can also bring violence to itself. And I say cleaning in many senses, like this, this experience has to be non-sexual, non-sexualized, not present with, uh, with all the, um, yeah, all the, all the, I don't know, the excesses that are present here. So Kala Gan, a midwife, uh, she worked this, uh, she, she wrote this work on Bertha's Dirty Song. So she writes uh, the following, although during the labor and delivery process, all body products are assumed to be contaminating or dirty, there are particular body parts or organs or individuals which are treated as if they are particularly dirty. The woman, her baby, and her family are seen as contaminating to varying degrees because of the continual potential severity of the contaminating ability of the woman. The woman, she's the person who needs to be most constrained. The pregnant woman is a paradigm case of boundary transgression as well as a forbidden mixing of kinds. And this sounds to me really like grotesque uh, uh, association with the grotesque bodies, yes. Yes, and the next one. And of course, dirt relations are, all, are always power relations. And she writes again, Calatan, dirt relationships are power relationships. Those who control childbirth are the medical profession and institutions who together have determined who and what is contaminated or contaminating and how this contamination should be contained. The laboring woman is vulnerable and dangerous. The midwife has become powerful because contemporary conceptions of dirt make all the current rituals wearing of protective protective clothing, management of the dirt body, fluids and substances surrounding birth necessary to protect the health professionals. This power, powerfulness is recent, new, and reverses previous constructions. A major focus of the work of the midwife is the controlling, containing, and cleansing of the dirt surrounding birth. And the next one, before I, uh, yes, so sanitizing birth requires subordination. Yes. The discourses and discursive practices surrounding the women and midwives as the labor progresses show that the, woman has dirt, that the woman is dirty for several reasons. She's continually leaking through the labor. She's on the margins and she's doing hard physical work. Because of their perceived dirtiness, the women and their families are kept in their, in their place. Birth dirt, dirt exists, but its, exact, it's exact, exact nature will vary depending on the time, the place, the culture, and the discourses which surround birth. However, whoever does the dirty work will be in a subordinate position. The midwife is a mediator and in a paradoxical position of being powerful and powerless in relation to birth dirt. The methods of sanitizing birth require subordination of women as mothers and midwives to dress behavior discourses and practices to keep the most powerful safe. 
I think it, this is very interesting in the context of the, the role of midwives, how midwives were perceived as dirty and witches and all these in the past, and then they become part of the medicalized system. So they have a role of cleaning and sanitizing. So in this way, they are powerful. But again, they are between the woman and the medical staff. So they are doing the dirty work in a, in a sense. So um, again, they're powerful and powerless, powerless also regarding this medical staff who is the, the epitome of cleanness no? and the, con the control. In fact. Yes, and now for shame. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so I want to speak a little bit of shame also in the context of my work, my past work, and also of future work. So this is the paper I published with my PhD student, uh, Keshet Korem. So it's called Domesticating Bodies, the Role of Shame in Obstetric Violence. And the argument is that shame is another tool for perpetrating obstetric violence in the sense that when women are ashamed, because of two main things we are arguing in this paper. One is their bodies, and other, the other is their bad mothering. So um, obstetric violence can be perpetrated. Uh, and um, because women are interiorizing this, and they let the medicalized system do things to control them and to, to, to help them to get rid of this shame, the shameful uh, presence. So in this um, paper, yes, we speak about women and shame. We take Sandra Barkey's um, concept of shame of the oppressed, <coughs> present in her shame and gender um, uh, paper article. And we speak about how pervasive is shame, in women, you know, why, what, what Barkey says is that shame is not something that happens to women sometimes, but it's pervasive in their existence. Um, it's unproductive and not even morally useful and probably disempowering and precludes social change uh, because of its being so pervasive. I mean, Barkey, of course, is, she's answering to, of course, this, this, the argument about civilization having to have some degree of shame, right? So some degree of shame is productive. It's, uh, it makes us uh, being able to live together. But this is a pervasive shame, it's even not productive in this sense. Um, <clears throat> yes, we can continue. So this is, <clears throat> this is Luna's <clears throat> speaking about uh, women's bodies are as constantly shameful, constantly um, interiorizing shame. And she argues women's bodies are continuously positioned as inadequate or inferior when compared to these elusive body ideas. Shame and body shame in particular becomes a permanent possibility. Women are already attuned to the feelings and contours of body shame. They expect their bodies to betray them and to deviate from the diffuse and invisible cultural standards of what a body ought to be, failing to achieve the ideal body signals, a deeper failed mystery of the body and corporeal control. This attunement to shame is so pervasive and indeterminate that it is often beyond the reach of reflective consciousness. And I think we can use this to speak about the body in labor completely. I mean, this, these women's bodies in labor are many times um, being seen as too fat, too dirty, too, too incapable, too sexual, too hairy, etc. Yes, and, and they are being seen as unable to give birth as they should many times. I have here a quote on, <clears throat> yes, the next one, on also Lyerly, she's, a, she's a, an obstetrician who worked in an obstetric unit and then retired, but she, uh, she describes her experience as an assistant uh, with Dr. P. So she said, Dr. P insisted, for instance, that the perineum of every patient be completely shaved before he delivered her baby. 
after a delivery, you would order, hurry, 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 God damn it, hurry. Nobody's going to look down there for a long time when I try to sew up women's lacerations with some attention to aesthetics. In exaggeratedly cleaning, shaving, and then disgustly dismissing the importance of repair beyond adequate homeostasis, he reinforced the conception of female sexuality and female genitalia as dirty, impure, solid, and may thereby have reinforced the shame of embodiment during a time in which the embodied woman was in fact doing an extraordinary thing, producing another human being. So it's a lot of shame in the, in the labor room. <laughs> yes. And about good, mother, good motherhood and self-sacrifice and the erasure of, erasure of subjectivity. This is the other side of the shame in the labor room. It's not only my body, which is wrong, but also how bad, how bad of a mother I'm going to be if I am worrying about what's happening with me and with my body in, and not exclusively with what is happening with my baby. And of course, this dichotomy of the baby and slash mother is being used constantly by doctors and the medical staff to, to convince women or force women to go through certain procedures. Also what we know, what we call in the obstetric violence research as the dead, the dead baby card. Yes, of course. I mean, who is going to do anything if they're threatening you with the, the baby as it's going to happen something to, to you? And this can go on and on because um, they can convince you. I mean, even if the baby is just suffering, I mean, why? what kind of mother are you that want your baby to wait more to go out? Why don't you agree to this induction? You know, it's for the baby. So this is a, really a tool that is used so much. Uh, so the ideal mother, as well as the ideal potentially pregnant and birthing woman is an unselfish woman who has abandoned or is willing to abandon selfish childish behavior for a higher form of femininity. The discourse of selflessness as central to ideal motherhood and femininity also affects women's perceptions of their optimal choices in childbirth, often pushing them towards a willingness to experience pain and suffering and undergo any experience identified with maternal sacrifice or toward absolute obedience to the medical staff. Thus, when it is internalized by women, this discourse also contributes to the reproduction of obstetric violence. This is part of our argument in this, in this paper. <clears throat> so we, we become these women in childbirth for which, for whom sacrifice is normal, pain is normal. And this is not very different from the usual existence of women in patriarchy. We, I mean, and why, why would we be different in the, the labor room? I mean, we cannot be suddenly arriving to the labor room and turn to be suddenly like real different women liberated from all these uh, this, uh, stereotypes and stigma, et cetera. We are what we are, what we are yes. And, 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 and sacrifice is normalized for women, you know it, and for also for, of course, for future mothers. And we can speak about some places or cultures where this is even more present. And I'm thinking about the Latin American context, for example. Um, and of course, pain also is normal. And I bring this quote from Lufu Bru, a uh, small, article on the female price of male pleasure. And she writes, women have spent decades politely ignoring their own discomfort and pain to give men maximal pleasure. They have gamely pursued love and sexual fulfillment despite tearing and bleeding and other symptoms of bad sex. They have worked in industries where their objectification and harassment was normalized and chased love and sexual fulfillment despite painful conditions. No one, especially not their doctors took seriously. I wish we lived in a world that encouraged women to attend to their body's pain signals instead of powering through like endurance champs. It will be great, it will be grand if women and men were taught to consider a woman's pain abnormal. Better still, if we understood a woman's discomfort to be reason enough to cut a man's pleasure short. But those aren't actually the lessons society teaches. No, not even to entitle my, my language. Yes. 
So, so we are we are really silenced in this experience because uh, again, again because of the normalizing character of this. So uh, pain and suffering perceived are perceived as integral to childbirth. Violent experiences of laboring women go unrecognized by both the women's immediate community and the medical staff, because all that mat all that matters is that the baby is healthy. And you know, when a woman has finally the, the courage to go out from the birth and tell people or the doctors or the family or the friends about what happened. And many times, it's a little bit like me too, many times she found against her like comments like, okay, you know, everybody goes to it, like this is, this is the way it is. And you have a healthy baby and you are healthy. And this is, again, a doubling oppression. You know, we know it from victims of sexual violence, how this acts, again, as, a, as, a, as, as doubling the, the violence that we, that we experienced. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so I found this many years ago in the net. Uh, at least you have a healthy baby. And uh, of course, it illustrates very well what what the price uh, was. Yes. Um, how do we break the the cycle of shame? Of course, we need structural changes in the childbirth model, uh, providing laboring women with control over their bodies, creating new models of femininity and motherhood. And resisting gender shame. So of course it's not easy, but I think until we don't really create these new models, we cannot start uh, really confronting and resisting and, and, and making things differently. Um, yes. So, and now uh, complicity, yes. <sighs> So one part of the complicity issue, or the complicity thing, is um, is complicity in the simple sense uh, that I spoke about it before. Women are uh, ashamed of their bodies, of their future motherhood, of their beings, and then they become complicit many times with this medicalized uh, violence and this obstetric violence. And they just, in a sense, allow it because they need to, in a way, no. It's it's it's. So I, I this is from my this is from my first article, and I argue labor in bodies are at least potentially perceived as antithetical to the myth of femininity, undermining the feminine mode of bodily comportment under patriarchy. They were seriously threatening the hegemonic powers. Violence then appears to be necessary in order to domesticate these bodies to make them feminine again. This is something that we already talked about. Therefore, women who don't want to suffer from this violence might, of course, approach childbirth through a body that is already hesitant, docile, and silent. Becoming feminine on our own might save us from being put in our place by others. So complicity might be even a tool or at least um, desired tool, it's, it doesn't always bring the results, but a, a tool for, um, for uh, encountering this violence before it happens. No? If, I, if I behave like a good girl, maybe they will be okay with me. Uh, many women, I mean, we know that this is not, of course, a solution, and that many well-behaved girls in labor are Again, uh, they, are, they are suffering violence anyway. Um, so yes, so we become complicit of the system and many times either behave well in expectance not to have these interventions or we say yes to the interventions because we are so ashamed of what we are and who we are that we are and we say, okay, this is this is what I have to go through. This is this is okay. But in a new paper or chapter, I'm trying to write uh, now. I, I wrote it's a chapter and it's, it hasn't been published yet. 
Yes, we can go on. Um, I think about complicity in, in the labor room uh, in a more complicated and nuanced way. And uh, it, it has been a chapter that has been hard for me uh, to write. And also as a feminist, it's hard. I think it's hard to write about these things. But in the chapter, I'm trying to sort out the role of, for, for example, privileged women like me coming to the labor room and just giving themselves to the medicalized system. And I say, maybe we have some responsibility. I think it, I mean, when we speak about obstructive violence and in all my work on obstructive violence, I have refused to, of course, um, uh, blame the victim you know, about this. Of course, this is not what I want to do. Uh, but I'm thinking about how we become complicit with these systems too, and how um, even when we don't have to, uh, we might be being complicit. And I took the uh, work of uh, Charlotte Knowles, uh, she has a lot of work uh, lately, speaking from phenomenology about uh, complicity and saying, that complicity, first of all, is not when we need to be complicit, because then we are not complicit. Complicity is when we, you can be otherwise, and you are still doing it. So, and she speak about complicity as more than shame or adaptive preferences. You know, the, 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 the argument for adaptive preferences, maybe you know it, it's of course a feminist argument that we are doing, we're being complicit because we have, we have to be adaptive to this patriarchal culture, so we need it. But she says something different. She says, um, she insists, and this is what I write about what Nolte writes. She insists that both Beauvoir and Heidegger recognize the human the tendency to choose self-objectification and to reinforce and embrace submission and escape responsibility, even when conditions in fact allow for freedom. Whereas the approach from adaptive preference assumes that what really needs to be explained is what, what and how external factors can impose things on us in such a way that we turn away from our, our own flourishing and become complicit in our own subordination. A phenomenological approach rejects the natural trajectory claim and takes complicity as a baseline. In this respect, complicity is not a response or reaction to external circumstances as it is for the adaptive preference theorist. It is not primarily imposed, nor is complicity some kind of defect. What the phenomenological analysis I have developed highlights, therefore, is that even if nothing was imposed on us, self-responsibility might still be refused, and thus an agent could, could still be complicit in their own subordination. Okay. So maybe we have a phenomenological tendency to submit before we have a phenomenological tendency to be free. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is what we, we, we come to this scenario already wanting to be objects, because why wouldn't we? Maybe it's easier, it's less complicated, etc. So, but maybe we have some responsibility in this, uh, giving ourselves to, to this. Okay, and for the last part of the talk, um, what can disability theories bring us for um, tackling um, or arguing against obstetric violence? Um, so what, what, I, what I want to uh, bring about in this, in this new research is to say that the way that disability theories, especially Greek phenomenology, understand bodies as and as a way to understand bodies and embodied existence as um, uh, wishfully not normalizing. I mean, it's, it's not just, these theories are not just saying we have to accept the, the abnormal, or we have to accept the, the um, this disabled. It's, it's even, it's more than that. It's to say these bodies or these minds, which are not the normal minds, they are, productive, they are interesting. They are, they are giving us hints, interesting hints about existence, about what we are in this world. So uh, my, my, my wish now is to take this and to try to see 
birthing bodies and the phenomena of obstetrical violence through these. So, yes, yeah, so I, I, I write, far from trying to cure disorientation, yeah, disorientation is an important concept here in disability theories and queer phenomenology. The pricing of being disoriented, yes, in existence, in our bodies, not to be like knowing where are we going all the time. So far from trying to cure this orientation or normalize our lost subjectivities, queer phenomenology suggests that these features are precisely what sustains human relations. The intersubjective relations of care and mutual protection necessarily derive from the recognition of vulnerability and disorientation, even if they clearly do not constitute the only response to those. Given that people also respond to disorientation and uncanniness with oppression and violence, mean to abolish those uncomfortable states. However, we can argue in favor of an ethical responsibility to respond to disorientation with compassion. So this is, this is a, the um, uh, proposal of uh, thinkers like LaJoy like, like now and, and Harding and others. Yes, and thus this project, my project, aims to help to create not spaces where birthing bodies, women and others will be oriented, but rather spaces that will be supportive of the experience and expression of such disorientations. Looking at the disorientation that is characteristic of laboring bodies and that accompanies the viewing of the experience of birth with awe instead of with fear and repulsion, may I argue bring about significant changes in how the medicalized systems and system and birthing women relate to birth. Hopefully contributing to a consciousness raising about both obstetric violence and the complicity of birthing women in, in their own submission, as well as about why and how to resist both of these phenomena. And the last, my last uh, proposal, um, yes, one of the main goals of group phenomenology has been to embrace disorientation, to argue for the ethical, aesthetic, and epistemic value of being lost of encountering others in the midst of confusion and uncertainty. I shall argue that such an attitude towards the lived experience and the lived world may aid in resisting obstetric violence. A medical system that even partially, even critically, adopts the idea of disorientation as a space in which it is possible to linger and that incorporates other important reflections on the potential of illness offered by quick phenomenology might thereby become better equipped to deal with the grotesque birthing body and less prone to attempt to tame or control it through violence. This attitude could also help birthing subjects to embrace their own disoriented birthing body instead of fearing it, and as a consequence, becoming complicit <coughs> in their own submission to medical ob objectification. And I think I finished with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Too much. That's amazing. That's Thank okay. you, Sarah. Typing notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. Sarah. Um, we've got some time. I think we'll run till eleven thirty, so we've got plenty of time for questions. And um, I can keep. I've got my Zoom open here, so I can keep my eye on hands in the Zoom room. And if there are any questions in the room, we can alternate between the room and Zoom. We need to see the, those those friendly faces. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, we've got two. We've got three screens of people on Zoom. Uh, so, any questions? Yeah, Kat, go ahead. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. sure. Um, um, so, I'm really interested in the part about complicity, um, and also, and, and I was thinking about why does this happen. Um, um, so, I guess my question is more of is here just some, so is this something to do maybe with the fact that oftentimes to to resist one's objectification, even where it is possible, means to encounter more resistance, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something about the way in which it, is it that there's something about the way that it can be easier, mm -hmm. literally in the way in which you come up against a space, against 
um, into subjective relations mm -hmm. that makes it easier to submit mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to choose. Mm -hmm. um, this. Yeah, I mean, look, this is the, again, this is, I think, the normal and now a pop popularly feminist way to see complicity, mm -hmm. to say we are being oppressed. And if we are complicit, it's because we will encounter less violence, just less violence if we are complicit. So in this, uh, in this analysis, we are completely blaming the other for this mm -hmm. and saying, if I were free, if you were not oppressing me, I would, I would not be complicit or I would, and I will not be subordinate. I would, I, would, I would be free, I would embrace my freedom. And what no says, uh, through Beauvoir and Heidegger, mm -hmm. is that it's more profound than that, that maybe we don't have this natural tendency to be free. That maybe since the beginning, we want to be objects more than subjects. So maybe it's easier mm -hmm. to exist this way. So maybe it's not just the, you know, the adaptive preferences that you're talking about, but it's like a more profound, I don't know, existential phenomenological tendency to exist in the world as yeah. Well, I, I, I guess I was wondering sort of what, what um, I'm really interested, I have to go read the North paper, but what yeah. is, what, so what, um, how does she argue with Heidegger and de Beauvoir that it is, why is it easier for us to, um, to subordinate ourselves, to mm -hmm. submit rather than to essentially choose freedom? Okay, so it's complicated and I know <laughs> Beauvoir more than Heidegger, but for Beauvoir, for Beauvoir it was very clear that I mean that we as women, um, many times we, we we want to be objects. I mean it's it, it, it's a higher it's a higher moral state to not to want to be objects. So it's not that we born. I mean we born with this core freedom that we want. In a sense, she says we wants to be free, etc. But um, what she says. Um, she blames, for example, privileged women for being complicit. Mm -hmm. And if she blames them, it's because she thinks she, they have responsibility, they have other mm -hmm. way. So um, if, 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 if we adopt completely this thing about being uh, oppressed and then being complicit, we cannot, we cannot take responsibility. Mm -hmm. We cannot blame, yeah. blame ourselves. And she, she does that. So, but I think it's really... <laughs> Have to discuss this more because it's, it's complicated i think in feminist terms also to say and to differentiate when i'm really when i don't have any other means but being complicit or when i do have what is this um, moment when when i can say or what is this condition where i can say yes i'm responsible for being complicit or not i think it's not so easy and clear mm -hmm. to find this but i think it's a very interesting issue to solve also another feminist uh, struggles and not, not only on this. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd love to talk more about that. There's a yes. few questions. Nicole, you did have your hand up. Do you want to, I know before Katja did, so do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for this amazing talk. I have plenty of questions, but I will keep it short, I promise. Um, I was wondering, we already, discuss about that, but I want to, you know, know something more about the idea that obstetric violence is not something only related to pregnancy or childbirth. You mentioned miscarriage as, let's say, a specific example. And I also was wondering cases when people um, um, seek for an abortion mm -hmm. and the right of abortion is not taken for granted in many countries in that world also in Italy. And for instance, when a person is taken for abortion and this possibility is not getting real because practitioners refuse to do that. Do you think we're facing a case of obstetric violence? And another case is the one of vulvodynia. So different kind of pathologies related to the female bodies which in some stories also are also related to reproduction, but not exclusively. What do you think about that? Do you think your account could be used for taking care and explain also other kind of phenomena? That's my question. 
Yes, thank you, Nicole. Yeah, we have we have discussed this, and I think yeah, yeah. I think of course. I mean, the abortion issue and the the medicalized uh, institutions uh, uh, forbidding this, or and, and and even even if 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 they allow this, uh, there are some experiences like we have discussed. For example, forcing a woman to see her embryo in the ultrasound, for example, before they go through. So um, I think it's worth to study these experiences. I think shame there is an element again that we need to to to, to discuss. I mean. It's, it's exactly shame. I mean, it's like telling the woman, okay, we, we will do it. Okay, but just, you have to watch. It's just, it's just a normal, it's just, a, you know, like, a, like an intervention, a practical thing. <laughs> but in the end, it's of course saying something about who you are and what you are going to do to this uh, live, uh, yes, uh, fetus, mm -hmm. etc. So I think manipulation, shame, are there in a strongest, in a very strong sense, mm -hmm. and of course, I think we could write about obstetric violence in this in this sense. I am sometimes, you know, as a philosopher, I am worried about using the concept too broadly, and that it will go lost, also with yeah. other uh, conditions of women and that. So I think maybe which we have to create other concepts or. Or, or parallel uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, explanations that will go deeper into other things, and and the, I think to, to nuance maybe to nuance really the, the, the conversation about it would be yeah yeah thank you because what what I was thinking is that even in the case of abortion, the baby to be mm -hmm. is the main actor. Yeah, and this may be like one of the like say structural elements of what obstetric violence is and how it works. That's just something I was yeah. thinking of. Yeah, so. yeah, but it's but it's not only that. I think in obstetric violence there are many things, not only the central presence of the of the baby. It's also who you are as a woman, how you have to behave as a woman, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I take a question from the room. Although today. Um, Gemma, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I've got so many thoughts. But the, uh, I guess, the, yeah, the the thing I wanted to ask was, um, you started talking about how how we might change this, like how um, you know what what kind of like structural changes in the childbirth mm -hmm. model um, might look like. And I was wondering whether you have ever had the opportunity to talk with medical professionals. Um, no, I'm not, not very successful. I say, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I, I mean, I'm just I'm going I'm going to be working with medical professionals quite a lot over the coming months, and and I was just thinking as you were talking about like what con what conversations with them about this might look like, or or where where to start like how how to start conversations about about this um, okay. yeah. whether you had any any thoughts or any suggestions or any yeah. experiences of, of that i can say i have i mean maybe i have two important experiences to talk about but it's also of course very anecdotal so it doesn't say much about uh, a general recommendation or something but on the one hand i would say that for for of course that speaking with midwives it's always easier Mm. And usually midwives are, are more, much more open to mm. listen and to reflect about these things than mm. obstetricians or medical staff. Um, my experience with doctors, so I can say there are two very opposite experiences. One is the one that I wrote about in my paper on gaslighting. And it was when I met this very young, uh, very nice obstetrician when I was miscarrying, one of my main miscarriages that I had. And I was in a, almost a seven week uh, pregnancy and I was bleeding. So I came to just, you know, the general 
uh, the hospital and because I was afraid because I had a very traumatic one before so I didn't want mm. to something happen so she she checks me and she says uh, no you know I see a, with an ultrasound and she said yeah, I see an embryo four weeks old everything seems okay and I was like yeah but I'm bleeding yeah no you're bleeding like many women are bleeding in these weeks and I was like no but you know I have I, I am almost seven weeks pregnant and not four. So I guess this is an area that stopped developing like many times happened in my other. And she said, um, well, it, but you don't know when you got pregnant in, in, in reality. And I was like, no, yes, but I know. <laughs> so no, you, you don't really know. <laughs> and, and, and she, I am like, why you don't believe? I mean, I, I, I feel ovulation. I even had tests, ovulation tests. She said, well, this is what I'm seeing in the ultrasound. I cannot base my diagnosis in your intuitions. And she said, just go back, back home. I think everything is going to be OK. You will be here in another nine months. You will be first. And I went home, and I was just furious. And, and then I, and, and also in the, in the meeting, I, because she was nice, I told her, you know, I'm working on obstetric violence. You know where she is. And she was like, yes, I think I've heard about it. Later on, she told me she hadn't heard about it ever. But I, I, I told her, you know, I'm going to write you. So in the end, she said, yes, you can send me your paper if you want. So she was nice. So I went home and then I wrote her an email and told her how violent her, her treatment was and why she didn't believe me. And she didn't have to. I mean, it wasn't, it was not that I was like telling her, you know, I think I'm seven weeks pregnant because an angel came and told me. I mean, my diagnosis was possibly accurate as hers. Mm -hmm. And it was in the end. So she could have said something like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you're right, go mm -hmm. home, we'll see. And she didn't, she just discredited mm -hmm. it. So I told her this and I sent her my paper, not such a violent, and she mm -hmm. read it. And it opened her eyes mm -hmm. and it exploded mm -hmm. her. And in the end we became, Colleagues, and she's working on such violence now right. with me. And right, right. So this was one experience. Right. The other experience is this doctor that I showed you in the photo, mm -hmm. and I was in a conference with him, and he started. It was an, a, a panel on autonomy, and the only thing he he got to say is to bring an example of a woman who came from a home birth to the hospital, and she refused uh, treatment. And then in the end, they did a very hard vacuum and the baby is damaged. Mm -hmm. So she has autonomy, but he also, the baby also has autonomy. Okay, not now, but in three minutes, he will have autonomy. So what we will prefer, her autonomy or his autonomy. So again, speaking in such, you know, like uh, totally plain, simple, dichotomies, baby, mother, you should be doing whatever I tell you because I'm going to save you and your baby. So, and he's a professor, he's a very big. So when I find these kind of responses, I say, maybe there are some people that we don't have anything to talk with. Mm -hmm. And there are some new, I think, very mainly younger, I think, of tutorials that I think they're mm -hmm. more open. Sometimes they are a little bit afraid of the, this term violence mm -hmm. and I always explain this is a structural term mm -hmm. this is not to say almost never that a doctor is being bad mm -hmm. that is being consciously violent mm -hmm. it's just the system sometimes there are doctors that they are mm -hmm. but usually it's a system which which is making them to act like mm -hmm. this and so I think this might be even mm -hmm. less uh, trauma hard for them to mm -hmm. And the last thing I will say about this, that I, th I think also it, we need to speak with obstetricians, with midwives about their traumas. Mm -hmm. They are experiencing trauma every day, also in the labor room, and they are not being treated. They are not being helped. And they usually many times act from their traumas on. I remember with this, this doctor, this, this friend, woman, She's telling me, you know, when I see a woman not wanting to do a cesarean, when I tell her to, I see the baby that died yesterday because we didn't do a cesarean on time. Mm -hmm. And I tell her, but you cannot, you cannot act medically from your last experience yesterday. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. 
So I think this is also one thing that has to be responsible. I mean, the strong. Yeah. Okay. okay, there's lots of questions. Yeah. There's a hand up um, in Zoom, and there's also like three or four questions in the chat. But um, start with Kate, if you've got your hand up, Kate, there. And then Lucy, if you also had a question. Hello, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I missed the beginning because um, I messed up my timings of things. So I did miss the, the beginning of the talk, but I caught uh, the, the, the majority of it. Um, and I'm very interested in this from kind of a philosophical point of view, political philosophical point of view, but also from my own experience. And maybe that's how I got there. Um, I don't know. Um, so I was thinking while you were talking in the chat about how privileged women can resist this. So if it's a structural violence, if what you're describing is a structural violence, but as privileged women, we need to act individually um, to resist the, the violence. Um, I, I wonder how we can do that. And I'm thinking about my own experience of childbirth when I had um, I had two, cesare two cesareans, one, one was an emergency cesarean and that dead baby card that you were talking about was definitely present. Um, uh, there was an emergency situation, I was terrified, I was also heavily medicated already mm -hmm. and then told, you know, this is, this is happening, whatever. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, as, as a privileged woman, I probably have the resources somewhere to try and resist kind of what's happening mm -hmm. to me. But I'm not entirely, I, oh, I'm not sure that I would have been capable of kind of properly resisting the stuff. Or even if I'd have wanted to, and like even on reflection, you know, I wanted the baby, I was there because I wanted to have the baby. Various things that happened that were probably um, um, not necessary that probably were unnecessarily violent. I, I didn't properly understand what was what was going on. So I'm not sure that I've had, I'd have had mm. the capacity to resist in that moment. Mm. I hope that question makes sense. I completely agree mm. with you, and that's why I think this is trick. This is a tricky issue and a tricky paper. And I had the same experience that you had in a way. I mean, I came to the labor room being a 37 year old woman professor or even at least with a PhD and you know, knowing things. And I was completely, I gave myself to this medical aid system. Also, I wasn't very afraid, very stressed. So, and, 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 and I think you are right saying that if the, the, the violence is so structural, how can we as individuals you know, to resist it? Maybe I'm thinking a little bit um, in, in, in smaller terms. For example, the fact that the woman comes to the, that the privileged woman comes to this uh, labor room when she's okay, no, not when she's already in an emergency, when she's okay. And she says, she tells to the, to the staff, just do whatever you need to. I mean, yeah. I don't have any plan. I, don't, I mean, you know, you know, you just tell me what to do. Mm. And I, have, I have met some midwives, uh, like very, you know, struggling midwives who tell me, I don't like this. I feel very bad when women come, come to me in this, in this way, because I feel that all the responsibility is on me and I would like them to know, to tell me more what they want, what they're planning to. So maybe at least in a small sense of, you know, not coming completely surrendering to the, mm -hmm. to the but, I, but I don't know. I mean, I, I need to think about it much more because I think it's a, it's a tricky thing. It's very difficult. Yeah. And of course, I don't want to, blame victims and I don't want to responsabilize women in these in these scenarios but I think if we erase completely the question of responsibility it's not fair also uh, in relation to other women who are really in a precarious situation who are experiencing mm -hmm. obstetric violence in a way but they can of not totally not resist it so I don't know so maybe part of it is kind of once like ahead of time kind of criticizing the system and yeah. then kind of reflecting on it like we're doing now writing about it kind of maybe that's that's how 
I how, even if in the moment of the violence you can't resist you can yeah. criticize the phenomenon I, I think at least that and I think it's in a way I don't know I have to think but in a way it's similar maybe to what happened in, in sexual violence in some ways yeah I yeah. think I took a little bit of me too in this yeah. uh, in, in this paper and, and the criticism that Knowles does, for example, to some uh, women, very privileged celeb ce celebrities mm. who said, it is my right to give myself to other men and to be, uh, to, I don't know, to be harassed because this is what womanhood is or something like that. And she's, she, she blames them. She said, you cannot, you cannot say that, you cannot do this. You can at least need to, and, and, and it's very, sometimes in feminism, it's a little bit tricky to yeah. do this. Yes. So, I'm sorry. Um, okay, turn back to the room. So, Lucia, do you? Yeah, ask? Um, this is slightly off topic, uh, but I, I was just kind of wondering, you mentioned at the beginning that you had sort of a theory around why it was Latin America mm. that pioneered kind of this, this idea of, of obstetric violence, and just on the topic that, that was just previously discussed. I was also thinking around kind of hermeneutic injustice and the fact that the name mm. obstetric violence wasn't necessarily something that people can, might have had access to beforehand. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and Juanita put in the chat, I'd love to hear Sarah's theories on why Latin America has a longer history of pushing back against obstetric violence. So that might relate to that yes. comment as well. <laughs> Two yeah. and one yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is only a theory. <laughs> it hasn't been proved. I think what was um, unique from Latin America was the presence of this violence in a very blatant sense. Mm -hmm. A not subtle, like for example, sometimes in Europe or the United States, like really shouting women, letting the, letting them out of the what what we say about the obstetric violence is like the um, too little too, too little too late too much too soon too much too soon is in the world world uh, the, the rich societies, you know it's too much intervention too soon in the more marginal societies is too less, uh, too, too late. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a violence that it's much easier to see, to understand epistemically as violence. So it was visible, it was, it, it was very present in Latin America. And at the same time, Latin America has a tradition of struggling, mm -hmm. of political struggling mm -hmm. and rising against injustice, etc which we don't have in other, I don't know, maybe some African countries, although I don't know, there's a lot of obstetric violence, but maybe there's less possibility of struggling against. I mean, I think Latin American societies are in the middle world, are not so terribly precarious, some of them, and not wealthy. So they have this possibility of fighting and struggling and understanding this violence as violence. Mm -hmm. And also this violence was more clear, much more clear than, than what we have now in Europe. So, so, so that it was like very spectacular and that was what it was. And also that they are that they have a history of being like political, having political struggles. And, mm -hmm. and um, so Harold? Yes, hello, um, and thank you for uh, an extraordinary experience. I'm actually calling from uh, from Canada, Alberta, Canada. So it's about four o'clock in the morning for me. No, so <laughs> uh, I, I hope I feel the expectations. <laughs> uh, beyond beyond so, I um, I'm uh, I'm actually sort of um, I'm extremely excited to be part of this conversation or at least to be able to attend it and, uh, and uh, you can ask a question. I, I'm an anesthesiologist, uh, so I practice in the, in the field that, that uh, this is the system and I've been there for about 25 years uh, doing so and obstetrics and women's health in general um, is an area of big discussion. And listening to this conversation um, has drawn up a lot of emotion for me um, and a lot of shame, specifically. Um, it's a, <clears throat> to me, I, I, I'm, I, I listen to the word complicity and, and I feel extraordinary compassion uh, for the entire process, both the system, the physicians, the midwives, the doulas, the families, <laughs> mm -hmm. because um, we, we work very hard, I think, to, to provide a safe environment, but it, 
we, we're always confronted with existential truth. Um, and that's always bigger uh, than all of us. And, and I think from a philosophical perspective, we're contending with that end of things. And then there's the very reality and the practical of how do we, how do we, how do we guide our principles of, of, of system design and care that's optimal? Not that we sort of have a system and then we have a woman and we have a, uh, um, a conundrum of how do we, how do we move forward? Um, and I'm not trying to take up too much time with this question, but it's just generated so many questions in my own mind, in my own practice. Uh, when, when we do have s seriously negative outcomes um, that lead to extraordinary shame, we have birth defects that women, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like there's an existential anger that we can't do anything about. Mm -hmm. And we're fighting it um, in pieces as opposed to coming together as a collective. And, uh, and, and I mean, that's just a thought. It's not so much of a question, but that's just what's going through. It's swirling in my mind, I think. Mm -hmm. um, because I do ask the question I, I had was, what is complicity? Uh, is it fair? I don't think it is. I think that we're all complicit in this big game of existence. And, uh, and we, we try to fight our complicity in it. But is that possible? Is it fair? Or is it even more shaming to suggest that we can? Mm -hmm. doulas, doulas come and they present a sort of knowledge for the patient who is completely ignorant to everything. because. So much of this is, is just go by even in evidence-based medicine. We're trying to come up with the best answers. We're trying to come up with the safest ways. And it's a very sterile, <laughs> not, you know, uh, non-human way of approaching something almost. But it, um, it, it, it's, it's almost impossible for anyone to have all of the knowledge that they need to, so to say, hey, I know exactly how this outcome is going to look. I've got a crystal ball. And, and, um, and that is inherently shaming. So I see the word as complicity. And what would the alternate to complicity look like? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So many thoughts. And I, I don't think I have a, like, a, of course, a response to what you're saying. Um, I'm just thinking maybe also one of the things, maybe it's, a, it's a utopian, it's not going to happen, but I think one of the things we should do as a society, it's again to get more more friend, friends with disability, death, the possibility of things going wrong. I think what medicalized, uh, uh, the medicalized birthing uh, structures have be, have have done, and and it's it's great, but it's almost it's also like what the medicine in general has done for our society now in the twenty one century is, is to 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 make making us believe that we can solve everything, that we can cure everything, that de death is a very terrible thing out there that we have to refuse. And, and I think, I mean, people giving birth in the past were much more made to the idea that things can go wrong. And um, also midwives were more acquainted with this and also women themselves. and. And I think that approaching birth with a super medicalized controlling, the opposite of disability theory's uh, position, it's very, it's very dangerous. It makes us to be, to feel like you said, very ashamed, um, very anxious of what is going to happen. And, and again, I agree with you that, that uh, staff and, 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 have to be part of this, this discussion. And um, they are also suffering. It's, it's, it's a little bit funny, but, but it's again the, the, the discussion about women in patriarchy and what is happening with men. And we know that we cannot speak about oppression in patriarchy and women without speaking about men and also what the price that they are paying for this system. So also, I think also staff, is paying a big, uh, a very high price for all these uh, systematic and structural uh, beliefs and, and ideas that we're promoting here. 
and but 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 again we 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 must not forget <clears throat> who is in the position of power here um, and of course yeah and <clears throat> and yes the the idea of complicity again it's i think it's problematic um we have to think about it more yes thank you um does anyone in the room have a question? <laughs> um, so I'm going to just read a couple that. Did you have a question? Your mouth opened. <laughs> no, I've got lots and lots of thoughts rather than questions. So I'll, yeah. you carry on with the questions out there. Yeah, it's such an interesting talk. You've got yeah. so many thoughts. And, yeah. We can chat later as well. Yeah. Um, so there is a question from Eleanor in the chat that was earlier on, but you can't see it there. She says, Thanks so much. This is excellent. I was wondering if you had anything to say about the repercussions of the experience of obstetric violence for women in a society where these experiences are silenced. I was thinking about maternal rage, postnatal depression, etc. I don't know if Eleanor is still here. I don't, don't think I see her. Um, I don't know yeah. if she's not here anymore. <coughs> <coughs> yes, thank you. Of course. I mean, and th th there are some researchers being done on how obstetric violence affects, for example, for postnatal depression. I think there are not, um, we have some research on how the experience of birth uh, reflects or influences postnatal depression. Um, of course, what we have seen is that women's satisfaction in their births is the most, a great uh, predictor of not being in a depression. And we know that it's not how much intervention was in the birth. It's not of a birth that is less technological, more technological, but it's how the woman experienced her own uh, control, her own, uh, um, how, how did she feel, how she was made feel made to feel in the in the birth. That's that's what it's important and predictive of satisfaction of, of women. Uh, but I agree, I think there have to be more research done on how this influences lots of phenomenon after post postpartum uh, feelings. Um, and then Chris, I don't know if you can speak or um, but you've put a couple of comments in the chat, but I can read them out if um, you like so first comment is I'm from Ireland where women were routinely subjected to force symphy I don't know that one symphysiotomy <laughs> thank you from the 1950s to the 1980s without consent or anaesthesia anis 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 yeah. anis sorry anis yeah. sorry mm -hmm. and made to feel stupid if they dared to question it wonder if you've encountered any similar practices elsewhere or, and are you aware of any study of the intergenerational mm -hmm. impact of such trauma inflicted on pregnant women Symphysiotomy, is that the episiotomy? Or it's what the is it? Breaking of the pelvic bone to widen the birth canal, I think. Ah, 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 ah. Yes. yes, okay. Um, yes, I know this procedure. Um, well, we didn't, I didn't talk about many things that are going on in this, uh, this research. But of course, there are many practices that are. Rebecca can say something about it. that many practices that uh, are being doing without women's consent, breaking of the waters, uh, uh, also doing the stretching of the canal before, and also, of course, episiotomies, uh, procedures that are already rendered illegal, like, for example, the Chris Taylor procedure, uh, the, the pushing of the women's uh, uterus in order to push the baby out. And uh, things like that, 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 that they're, they're being, still being done and many times without consent. And again, I've been working on my papers on testimonial injustice and hermeneutical injustice on the question of consent. And of course, we cannot stay in the question of consent because it's so tricky because we know that women say yes many times because they don't feel they have another options and they don't know what the options are. And also because we are women and we are used to take our desires aside and uh, be um, uh, com to comply to others' desires and, and willing. So, 
So, so of course, we will say yes in the beginning. I mean, I, I think what I, what I wrote in one of the papers is that, and also in my complicity paper, in the end, what I say is that this only means that the staff is even more responsible to pull women out of this complicity or of this compliance, because it's natural for us to comply. It's, it's, it's culturally natural for us to do it. So we need help not to keep complying, but really to, to, to be pulled out of this. And so consent, it's, uh, it's not enough. Uh, yes. So. And Chris had another comment, which is the last one in the chat. Oh no, not the last one, second last one. The problem is that there is a systemic bias against women in healthcare and in research where women's pain and concerns are routinely trivialized and dismissed as anxiety, such that even common female conditions such as endometriosis can take a decade or more to be diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Within that context, normalized obstetric violence is just one more invisible and inevitable outcome. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Francis had a question. Um, there's a couple of questions. Hello, Sarah. Thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. I was wondering whether Sarah had an opinion on the impact of omissions, for example, failure to provide mm -hmm. timely epidurals or deprivation, like the denial mm -hmm. of an elective C-section, which is so connected to the natural birthing mm -hmm. culture and shaming mothers who can't do it themselves. Mm -hmm. My work has found that this is a far bigger complaint in UK maternity wards, mm -hmm. and yet the law seems to focus much more on acts of over, or yeah. over medicalization. Yeah, uh, super interesting, and uh, I, I agree. And I agree that this is this is this is the other part of mm -hmm. obstetric violence, in my in my view. Um, of course, given that women know. <laughs> Uh, why do they want these interventions? Well, I don't know. Maybe they don't have even to know profoundly, but if they want it, they have, I think they have to get them. Um, what I want to say is that also I, one of my first papers on birth, not even on obstetric violence, discussed this uh, dichotomy of technological birth versus natural, natural birth. And of course the natural birth ideology has been very oppressive to, to women. And many women in, in many countries uh, find themselves very depressed after births because they didn't make it, because there were less, less women, uh, because they cannot, they couldn't do it. In the sense. So it, it has become a really oppressive ideology too. So what I tried to say in that paper, I tried to take the birth as a phenomenological experience and discussing it as a, in the Beauvoirian terms of immanence and transcendence and saying that this is a very immanent experience where we feel that the body is doing things that you cannot control, that they are there, you cannot escape them. <clears throat> um, contrary to, for example, the explanation of the marathon runner, that sometimes they say that there's natural birth, it's like a marathon, you know, you feel that you are doing, you're running, you're, yeah, but in the marathon you can stop if you want to know, birth is there, it's in your body, you are doing it forcibly if you, are, if you arrive to the birth uh, in any case. But then there's an aspect of the aspect of transcendence. You can do things. You can, you, you feel that you can make decisions, that you have, you, can, you have some agency on what is happening on your body or you should feel this way. And agency should be also the possibility of saying, I want this cesarean section now, or I want this induction, or I want this and this. So, of course, this I think this is not at, at all a defense of the natural birth uh, ideology. It shouldn't be. Thank you. Um, so I'll just carry on with the chat while we're all here. Rebecca, um, I'm curious, Rebecca Sykes, I don't know if you're still here. I'm curious about the issue of lack here. of knowledge. Um, where does the distributed knowledge of childbirth and women's health still exist, or is it being where is it being centered? Is it that privileged women might be able to have a companion or a doula who could act or intercede on her behalf? Thank you for such an interesting presentation. So, where, yeah, the distributed knowledge—I mean, yeah—of childbirth and women's health. What what does it mean the distributed knowledge of childbirth? 
I can I can come in if it helps. Yes, yes please. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, so this is uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Really interesting presentation. Although you know, my background is not a medical background, but um, actually from a, a sort of systemic social system design perspective. Um, so what I'm curious about is how distributed that the knowledge of these issues and even some of this terminology within society as a whole. Mm -hmm. where these kind of issues or say in in the growing up in my own growing up I'm I am from the UK but I have traveled quite a lot and lived around the place but uh in my ex experience you know, very little experience of what might be um, some of the issues that I might I've never had a child but I might encounter in childbirth it's not something which seems to be within embedded within community mm -hmm. in a way it's quite isolated it's it's mm -hmm. shut away so then when i say distributed knowledge i mean who is forming this knowledge who's sharing this knowledge mm -hmm. and i think the, the person from canada earlier just kind of saying um you know there's a kind of medicalized way there's this very scientific way of acquiring knowledge um but where is where does that get shared in a way and where does it get I won't say humanized in a way that's easily receivable easily and also knowledge that comes from as you say you know this circle here this group of people sharing their knowledge and we're learning from each other um it's, it's sort of not embedded in community in a way is what I want to say yeah no 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 I, I understand and I think it's important to say I mean I don't know if I will reply to your question right but it's important to say how influenced we are, at least in the West, at least in wealthy societies, uh, from the medicalized uh, birthing uh, ideology through media, through the, all the discussions that we find uh, always in, in society, in culture, what we can see in movies and, and you know, all this understanding of the birth as an urgent event where doctors are needed and urgency is needed and everything is going to happen very fast and, and the doctors have to take care of this and control this. And I, I a counter-narrative is really necessary. It's necessary because I think our our children and uh, the young generation, and they are all learning about birth in this kind of context and people don't see birth anymore. It's like, it's like the question of death. Again, no death, death was once, it's coming back as birth is coming back to homes in a, sometimes in some circles, but people don't see death anymore and don't see births anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of the community, as part of the living experience of being home, um, and this is a, this is a terrible loss, and this this has informed what we know about about birth and about dying, and I think they're both very very related, and and of course mm -hmm. in communities where death and birth are being done more at home or in communities. Uh, people know more about how these things look like and how these th things develop. And, uh, and, and yes, I think we now as a, as a society, we have a very poor knowledge on how these things happen. And this influences all the question of complicity, all the question of how women come to the birth in the hospital. Many women don't, many women, me included, don't really know how birds look like uh, and they usually hear about it from the you know preparation classes usually in hospitals or medical centers etc so so yes this is completely necessary yeah. mm, thank you there's just one final question in the chat that we can answer and then we, we can wrap up. Um, so it's from Katya who had to leave. Um, she right. says, I'll write my question here as I unfortunately need to leave. Um, I think it would be really helpful to clarify the idea that, and she quotes, even if we were not oppressed by anything, we would still have the tendency to be complicit. My question is complicit with what exactly? Does not complicity imply that there is something, a form of oppression with which we are complicit? 
The history of the concept in Beauvoir, Sartre, et cetera, is the context of France in the Second World War, complicity with the Nazi occupation. Mm -hmm. So the phenomenological tendency is maybe to escape responsibility for our actions, which in conditions of oppression can manifest as oppression. Mm -hmm. This is more of a comment, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if you have anything it is, to say. No, it is helpful. It is helpful to think. I think I'm thinking, but I'm thinking of an existential tendency, maybe to say, even if there are not like really big powers above us, just to, I don't know, our tendency to like to be children, to say, to come to the mother and say, just, uh, I don't know, cook, cook whatever you want. I don't want to decide. It's not mm -hmm. even has to be like a really oppressive power or something, but maybe, maybe yes, maybe there is an implication here that there have to be some authorities who are complying with, in a sense. And, but, but also the, the, the idea of our tendency, natural tendency to be free, it's a little bit strange. I mean, to, to flourish. Do, do we have a natural tendency to flourish if, every, if everything is right around us? If, if there are no oppressive forces? I don't know. Maybe we cannot even imagine this kind of reality. Mm. So, anyway, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, I think it is time to wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, we've gone on for a bit longer than we planned, mm -hmm. but I just like everyone to thank Sarah again. Um, for such Thank a fascinating talk and amazing discussion. Important thought-provoking work, I think that has, I mean, these ideas have applications far beyond childbirth, I think, and it's just super interesting. So thank you for coming thank you. and thank you thank for you speaking to us. Um, and thank you for everyone online. Um, this talk has been recorded and if you signed up via the event, Eventbrite, it, the recording will be sent to you automatically and it will also be available on our website so um, I know some people are asking already about the recording so just to let you know um, great thank you thank you for very, coming everyone with the comments in the chat maybe I would be able to see them yeah yes. can you save this no yeah yes. yeah we'll send it to you yeah right thank you very much <laughs> thank you <laughs> Bye, I think it saves it automatically. Yeah, I think it saves it automatically with the recording, the chat. Yeah. So I don't think you need to worry. I'll do it anyway, right here. Yeah. Alice okay. will sort it out. Okay. So Melanie, you have to stay in the end. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I had to suffer my struggles for soon. <laughs> I'm actually very grateful because I mean I got to listen and engage properly. So <laughs> that's right. Okay, I'll do this.